For those of you that don't know, Richard Feynman was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. He is super famous and probably one of the most famous physics people in history, right? In, in history of the world, he is extremely famous. He's written several books. He's written a physics book, which I have, which I should totally make a video on. And just amazing. So here in this video, I'm going to show you some books that he used. But what makes these books even more interesting is that he used these books to actually teach himself mathematics. These are books that he used for self-study in varying degrees. Also, one of the books I have here is the most expensive math book I own, I believe. I believe the most expensive math book I have is sitting here in a pile. I'm not positive, but but I'm pretty sure. In fact, uh, later on in the video, I'll actually go online and I'll check the price just to see how expensive it is, just to see if it's really the most expensive one I have. And I only paid like $10 for it, but I bought it uh, you know, over, over a decade ago. So let's start with this one, Trigonometry for the Practical Man. So f before reading this one, Richard Feynman read Algebra for the Practical Man, and he thought it was just easy. It was too easy. So he picked up this one, and he really didn't think it was that uh, interesting. For some reason, he really didn't find it appealing. It's called Trigonometry for the Practical Man. It's written by J.E. Thompson. And we'll, we'll come back, and we'll take a look at this book in a minute. Let's go ahead and jump to another book, which Richard Feynman read in its entirety, and he made careful notes, which he kept in a notebook. It's called Calculus for the Practical Man. It's also by Thompson, and it's also a, a great book for self-study. So this is a book you can use to teach yourself um, calculus. So this is the one that he really, really, like, used this to learn. And then we have a more advanced book here. This one is called Advanced Calculus. And this one was written by Woods. This is probably the most expensive math book that I have. And it's super old. I'm just going to look it up really quick here on the internet. I have access to, to a computer. And I'm just going to type it in, Advanced Calculus. Advanced Calculus by Woods. And I'm just going to see what's available. I'm, I'm just going to go to like Amazon and just click there. That's the first link that came up. And looks like there's one copy on Amazon right now for $319.99. Oh, look. Oh, no, never mind. There's seven used copies from $199. So very expensive book. And it's expensive because Richard Feynman uh, is noted for saying in one of his books that he learned some peculiar methods uh, you know, from this book. So... This book is famous because he referenced it. This book is also very rare and very out of print and contains some very serious mathematics. This is a really, really hardcore uh, advanced calculus book. I don't know if there's reprints available. Sometimes you can find reprints on the internet and you can get them for like less than 30 bucks. I will look and at the end of this video, when I post this video, I will go online and I will try to find uh, these books and leave links in the description. So why did Feynman use these books, in particular these these other books here. Let's start with the trig one, which he didn't find interesting, probably because Richard Feynman was, I, I, I don't want to use the word genius, but we can call him a genius. I mean, people would consider him a genius, despite the fact, despite the fact that when he was in, I believe when he was in high school, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe when, when Feynman was in high school, he took an IQ test, and his IQ was 125, which is considered high, but, you know, People think of an IQ of 125 and you think that's high, but not high enough for a Nobel Prize. Well, Richard Feynman was a person who had an insatiable curiosity for learning, and that's evidenced by all the things he produced. And if you look at his notes, you know, Feynman's actual notes that he took from this book, they were meticulous. So trigonometry for the practical man. Let's open it up. And I believe this is a reprint. Um, I think the original one is much older because this is published by uh, D. Van Nostrand Company, Inc. Let's see if we can find a copyright on this to see how old it is. Yeah, so this is a reprint. So 31 was the newer one, then 46, and then 62. This must be the copy from 1962, third edition, third edition. Let's just take a, a quick look at the contents here. And so this is a book that you could buy. Uh, this is probably available via reprint, or maybe you can find the original one. I will look. I don't know how readily available this book is. It's pretty hard to get, I think. So contents, angles, circles, and triangles, so basic trigonometry, okay, more basic trig, functions of 45, functions of 30 degrees and 60, so all those basic um, trig function angles and the values. 
whoops. I want to really jump to that and see what that's about, but let's keep going through the content. Solution of problems by means of right triangles, functions of any angle, properties and formulas of oblique triangles, oblique triangle calculations, solutions of problems involving oblique triangles, really interesting layout, uh, relations among the trigonometric functions, and the best thing about this book is that there are answers to exercises and problems on page 179. Um, well, I don't know if it's the best thing. This book is actually extremely good, uh, despite uh, Feynman um, claiming that it wasn't uh, very interesting. But you see here you have answers to all of the problems in the back of the book. And that's really nice. That's one of the nice things about uh, this these books for the practical man, the trigonometry for the practical man, algebra for the practical man. Um, they have, I believe, have geometry for the practical man. And they also have calculus uh, for the practical man. So you can check your answers, which makes this uh, a wonderful book uh, for, for self-study. Here's the introduction. The branch of mathematics, which is called trigonometry, is preeminently a subject devoted to measurement and numerical calculation. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's very computational in this book. Angles, circles, and triangles. So it starts from the very beginning. If you took a trig class today in college, like trigonometry in college, um, you could use this book to supplement what you learn, and I think it would turn you into a mathematics monster because it's presented differently, so you're going to get a different treatment, um, and anything you learn via self-study, is it's golden. I mean, Richard Feynman was a fan of self-study, and he used this book to self-study, but again, he found it uninteresting, uh, perhaps again because... It was, it was too easy, maybe. Um, he did say the algebra book was too easy, and he found this one uninteresting. That's really uh, all we know. So Trigonometry for the Practical Man. This is the book that he read in its entirety. It's called Mathematics for Self-Study. And it's called, sorry, it's called pra Calculus for the Practical, practical Man. This book here um, is part of this series. So if you look at older copies of this book, they also say, uh, mathematics uh, for self-study. I actually have uh, an older copy of this book. I'm just going to grab it really quick. Why not? It's, it's actually right here. So here's my older copy of um, Trigonometry uh, for the Practical Man by Thompson. So this one, this one has a different, let's just take a quick look at the copyright on this one. Oh, look at this. Look at this. In the manufacture of this book, the publishers have observed the recommendations of the War Production Board, and any variation from previous printings of the same book is the result of this effort to conserve paper and other critical materials as an aid to war effort. Wow. Wow. The country was at war, right? The United States was at war, and there were issues with paper. Um, that's pretty crazy. Trigonometry for the practical man. I mean, imagine living during that time. That's just... Really nuts. So yeah, look, this one's 1931. This must be uh, the first printing, or maybe not. It says here, first published, 31, and then it's been reprinted a gazillion times. Look how many times it's been reprinted. Look at that. That's just insane to me. So wildly popular book, uh, despite Feynman not thinking it was very interesting. Um, so yeah, same book as uh, this one. The size is a bit different. But this is this is the reprint, and uh, this is also a reprint. But I guess it's still like the first edition, perhaps. I, I'm yeah, I'm not. Perhaps it's just like a different printing. So I'm gonna put these down. Let's look at this one. So this is the one on calculus. This is the one that Feynman actually uh, pretty much read in its entirety and took meticulous notes. Associate Professor of Mathematics, School of Engineering, Pratt Institute, J. E. Thompson. It's kind of cool. He just sat down with his book and his notebook. And I think what, what really helps, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm not claiming to read Feynman's mind here, but I'm assuming, I'm assuming that what really helped him was that he had answers to all of the problems, right? You have answers to all of the problems in this book, which is on, let's just check those, 326. Let's check those first. Because, yeah, look at that. Well, those are just integrals. Those aren't the answers. Should have answers back here. There we go. Here are the answers to the problems, which is really nice. You see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You have all of them there. It smells incredible. I'm sorry, I just gotta give it a whiff here. Just ah, uh, it smells like an old comic book. It's just a really incredible smell. Let's take a look at the contents of this book to see 
what type of calculus you actually get. Is it, you know, single variable? Is it multivariable? This book on simplified calculus is one of the series designed by the author and publisher for the reader with an interest in the meaning and simpler technique of mathematical science. And for those who wish to obtain a practical mastery of some of the more usual and directly useful branches of the science without the aid of a teacher. Right. So these books are actually meant for self-study, this mathematics uh, for self-study series. And so it was around and in print during Feynman's lifetime. And so it makes sense that Feynman picked it up and successfully used it and learned enough math and and continued to learn math and physics and eventually won a Nobel Prize. Fundamental ideas, rates, and differentials. Functions and derivatives. Differentials of algebraic functions. So differential of the square of a variable, differential of the square root of a variable, the product and the quotient. So very basic, but notice we're only on page 22, right? So this book has a lot of information and it's really broken down into tiny little subsections, which make it really easy to self-study. You know, you've got these tiny little sections. You can sit down for half an hour to an hour, read it, do a couple exercises. You can check your answer and you can learn calculus like Richard Feynman did. I think that's pretty awesome. So differentials of trigonometric functions, velocity, acceleration, and derivatives, interpretation of functions and derivatives by means of graphs, maximum and minimum values, problems in maxima and minima, differentials of logarithmic and exponential functions. Cool stuff. Then we have a summary of differential formulas, reversing the process of differentiation, integral formulas, how to use integral formulas, interpretation of integrals by means of graphs, graphical applications of integration, and then use of integrals in solving problems. Well, population increase, the laws of falling bodies. I bet Feynman didn't know he was going to win the Nobel Prize when he was reading from this book. Um, that's pretty incredible. The natural law of growth and the number E. I, I, the Feynman story to me is one that is of great interest because, you know, I, I believe that effort is very important in mathematics. And I think that Richard Feynman um, just had an insatiable curiosity and effort towards math and physics. And that's how he was able to learn uh, so much. I mean, he just really cared about it. Fundamental ideas, rates, and differentials. Rates. The most natural illustration of a rate is that involving motion and time. If an object is moving steadily as time passes, its speed is the distance or space passed over in a specified unit of time. Cool. As for example, 40 miles per hour, one mile per minute, 32 feet per second, etc. And he goes on and explains some more of that. Let's look at some of the exercises. Let's just jump to like a random page. Here we go. What do we have here? Let's look at some of the, we have some illustrative examples. Okay. We have, so the differential, so super easy. X squared minus two X plus three. It's a really easy derivative. It's just going to be uh, two X minus two. So pretty, pretty easy. They go through, they do it with differential notation. So they find differentials. Okay. That's three examples. Look at that. Four, five, six. Oh, that one's harder. That's a lot harder. You have a product rule here there. Look, they show all the work. They go through all the steps carefully. They explain everything. So like if you didn't have a teacher, that's what this book is for. If you didn't have a teacher and you were just trying to teach yourself calculus on your own, this would work. Obviously, it's better if you have a teacher, right? Uh, you know, as much as I love self-study and I think it's great, uh, having a teacher, having a lecture is is much, much easier. Having a course, however, a book is kind of like a course, right? Because it gives you the structure. Wow, look at that, 12 examples. So you've got 12 examples, that's ridiculous. And then you have exercises. Uh, you have 20 exercises with answers to them uh, in the back of the book. Let's just check, it says art 19, 31. So it's page 30, 31. Let's go, let's go to the back of the book and let's just see, just to make sure it's there, right? Because we want to know. So, so it's going to be 19. So there it is right there. There, there are the 20 answers to the first set of exercises. So you get 12 examples and then you get 20 exercises with answers to all of them. So it makes it really, really good for self-study. The biggest problem with this book is its availability. I, I I didn't really look to see if it was available um, you know, before making this video, but I'm pretty sure you can get it and I will do my best to find these for you in case you want to 
Um, check them out. Integral Formulas. Wow. Wow. What a great book to think that a young Richard Feynman uh, sat down with his little notebook and, you know, he works through this and he, he learned calculus. So a more advanced Richard Feynman, uh, a Richard Feynman who knows how to write proofs, is much more mathematically mature. So now we're looking at a Richard Feynman here who, um, you know, he's, he's, he's learned a significant amount of mathematics. He knows math. And this is the book he uses, Advanced Calculus by Woods. This is the one that's really expensive. Um, I th it's probably the most expensive book I have. I have a lot of math books, but I've been collecting for a lot of years. And so some of them I've bought new, but, you know, they're math books. Uh, not that many people in the world collect them. <laughs> so a dollar fifty. So someone paid that. That was not me. I know I paid uh, not much for this. I bought this over a decade ago. Advanced Calculus, a course arranged with special reference to the needs of students of applied mathematics by Frederick S. Woods, professor of mathematics in the Mathematics Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> we could rename MIT, call it the Mathematics Institute of Technology. So there's a copyright on this one. I think this is the first printing. Copyright 1926. I think this is the first one. I think this is the first edition. This course in advanced calculus contained, the course in advanced calculus contained in this book. So it is a course. It's kind of like what I was saying earlier, right? Like these books, you can, you can get a course out of it. Has for many years been given by the author to students in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So that's MIT. So this book was used at MIT for many years, which is an incredible school. So you know that says something about the book. The choice of the subject matter and the arrangement of the material are the result of the experience thus gained. The students to whom the course has been given have been chiefly interested in the applications of the calculus and have felt the need of a more extensive knowledge than that gained in the elementary courses, but they have not been primarily concerned with theoretical questions. Nice. This is a course one in analysis. Very nice. So it's basically an intro course, but it's still very tough, tough. Um, you know, if you compare this to other analysis books, um, this is so much more advanced. Just to throw out some names, if you compare this to Understanding Analysis uh, by Abbott, which I actually have here. Let me just grab it, actually. I think I know where it is. I'm back. Here we go. I've got it. This is Understanding Analysis uh, by Abbott. So if you compare um, this old book, uh, by you know Woods to a modern book by Stephen Abbott, Understanding Analysis, you would see that the Woods book has significantly more content and is significantly more advanced. Does that mean that the Woods book is better than the analysis book? Absolutely not. Stephen Abbott has done a great job on this newer book, and this is a book for beginners. This is much more elementary uh, in his presentation than a book like this one. So this is something that, I mean, I'm a collector of math books, right? So to me, this is like super valuable and super priceless and incredible. So you get different knowledge in this book. You're going to find things in this book that you're not going to find in this one. So it's just a nice way to satisfy your curiosity. So if you're curious like Feynman was, then maybe this is a book to check out. Contents. So functions, continuity, the derivative, composite function. Rowley's theorem. No, I'm kidding. It's called Rawls, but I always wanted to say Rowley's. <laughs> Theorem of the mean, Taylor series with the remainder. So we've got some indeterminate forms, zero over zero, infinity over infinity. You can apply L'Hopital's to those. It talks about other forms. Infinitesimals, fundamental theorems on infinitesimals. It's interesting it's got that in the book, right? It talks about infinitesimals. You pick up a modern book on analysis, it's not going to do that, right? It's just not going to be in there. And then power series in chapter two. Look, page 38, we're discussing power series. Who does that, right? Who does that? Woods does. Definitions, comparison tests for convergence, the ratio test for convergence, region of convergence, uniform convergence. This is really good stuff. I really like this stuff. Hyperbolic functions. We should look at some of this stuff in a minute. Partial differentiation. To me, this is the most interesting of the books that I've shown you here because it's the most advanced and it's got a lot of interesting topics. Implicit functions, applications to geometry the definite integral, the gamma and beta functions. Then we have 
line surface and space integrals. This is Calc 3 type stuff, except you're going to see a rigorous treatment here, right? So people often ask, what's a proof-based multivariable calculus book? Well, here you go, right? Here's one that has a lot. Vector notation, differential equations of the first order, differential equations of a higher order. It's got DEs in here, which is pretty incredible. And there's more. Look at this. Bezel functions, partial differential equations, calculus of variations, functions of a complex variable. Wow. Elliptic integrals like OMG, right? And it has answers. Let's look at those. 387. So page 387, that's where we can find answers in this book. And you can see there are quite a few answers in this book. It doesn't have everything, right? We can see that obviously things are missing, but we do have some things, right? We do have some answers, and that is better than no answers, uh, in my opinion. So this book is extremely hardcore. Let's, let's see how it starts. Starts with very basic advanced calculus, chapter one, preliminary functions. A quantity y is said to be a function of a quantity x if the value of y is determined when the value of x is given. Someone wrote in the book, that was not me. Elementary examples are the familiar algebraic, trigonometric, logarithmic, and exponential functions by means of which y is explicitly given in terms of x. Such explicit formulation, however, is not necessary to the idea of a function. And so here we have some examples. And it talks about continuity. It's got some graphs. It's pretty good from a book from the 20s, right? 19, I believe it was 1926. Yeah, 19, 1926. Wow, that's a long time ago. That's, this is a, this is a pre-World War II era book. I mean, this is old. This is old, the derivative. Here's the definition. A function f of x is said to have a derivative uh, for x equals a, if the expression approaches a limit as h approaches zero in any manner, whatever. This limit is called the derivative for x equals a and is denoted by f prime of a. We write, in order that the derivative should exist, it is necessary that f of x should be continuous when x equals a, for otherwise the fraction one would not approach a limit. This condition is not sufficient, as may be seen by considering the function defined by the equations x times sine pi x when x is not. That's the example they give. <laughs> As x approaches zero, sine of pi over x oscillates infinitely between plus and minus one. Uh huh. But x sine of pi over x approaches zero. Hence, the function is continuous for zero. Yep. And then using this function in the fraction one, so up there, okay, we get this expression here. So, and it's, you get sine of pi over h. And that does not approach a limit as h approaches zero. Hence, the function has no derivative when x equals zero. So you could you could justify that a little bit more rigorously, but it's pretty clear that that is not going to exist. But you could probably give a proof there uh, with epsilon and stuff, but not uh, not really necessary. In 1872, Weistross gave the explicit statement of a function which has for all values of x the property which x sine pi over x has for x equals zero. So it is known now that a continuous function does not necessarily possess a derivative. Hence, when a new function appears in analysis, it is necessary to inquire first whether it is continuous, and secondly, whether it has a derivative. So it explains everything fairly well. It's got good pictures. I don't like this. Let me show you what I don't like. And this is going to sound silly, but I'm just going to come out and say it. I'm not a fan of that variable. Zeta or eta, I, I can't do it. I just, I've, I've given up on it. I took a, a functional analysis class once, and the teacher would use those because the book was using those. The Kreisig book on functional analysis uses those variables, and it was very painful. I just used x and y. So the teacher would write, teacher would write that down. I'd put x or something, you know, because I couldn't do the variables. But you can see here tons, tons and tons of mathematics uh, in a book like this. Just so much. Indeterminate forms, infinitesimals. I think we're getting to the end now. Uh, of this chapter differentials here's some exercises really nice exercises what do we got let's see by division find an expression okay find an expression for wow find the limits we got some limits here it's pretty tough some pretty tough some pretty tough stuff here right it's not like necessarily like the easiest exercises and that kind of says something about Feynman right I mean the guy really 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 
studied hard. I mean, this is pretty tough stuff. I wonder who wrote all this. This wasn't me. Blast from the Past. Power Series. Power Series are really, really cool. Um, for me, series are one of the things that initially got me interested in mathematics. You first learn about series, by the way, in a course called Calculus 2. So if you take Calculus 2, uh, that's when you would see series. But this is a you know proof-based hyperbolic functions. There's cosinch and cinch. You can think of cosinch as the average of e to the x and e to the negative x because you're averaging them, right? You're adding up and dividing by two. And cinch is half the difference. You're subtracting and dividing by two. Just fun extra knowledge. Figured I'd share. Yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff here. Really, really incredible book. So I just wanted to show you some books um, that Richard Feynman used because I think that um, it's just good to see them, you know? And I have a lot of math books and I think that this, this makes these math books special to me. So here we have Understanding Analysis. I'll, I'll give that a shout out. Um, great book for beginners, right? Probably better than the one by Woods for beginners, but the one by Woods has significantly more content. And then this is the one um, that Feynman actually read in its entirety. We know because uh, I'm pretty sure they found his notebook and he had, um, you know, detailed detailed notes that he took uh, from from this book. He, he created like a chapter, uh, you know, like, everything right he he went through it carefully and he created his own notes from this book and I, I he probably worked out almost every single problem so you know back then there was no internet so this this is it this is all he had you know books were all he had and mathematics for self-study calculus for the practical man by thompson is the book that he read in its entirety and then this one uh the tr uh, trigonometry for the practical man this is the one that he um, didn't really find that interesting. And he thought the algebra one was too easy. So kind of an interesting look, I think, at some books that a legend used to learn mathematics. If you have any comments on Richard Feynman or the books he used, do you have any of these books? Have you used these books? What do you think of these books? Do you think these books are outdated? Sometimes people will ask, is it outdated? Math does not get outdated. What I will say about this one, though, is that it's a tough book, but it's also a very beautiful book, and it's very well written. So if you can get a copy, it's worth it. I will leave links in the description to all of these if I can find them. Yeah, until next time, good luck. Take care. Thanks for being a subscriber.